For those of you who see me grow up in this church, um, I just want to take time to say thank you for everything. Um, Y'all have poured so much love and prayer and support into me and my family through many, many different things that have gone on. Um, The summer before sixth grade, I moved up from the Red Rug area um, into the youth group um, where, you know, many of y'all might not remember, but Brad Corbin was the youth minister for about a year for me. And then Michelle Schrader moved up and was with me from sixth grade all the way through ninth grade. And she poured into me more than I think anybody could ever understand. Um, And it's because of her that what I'm about to talk to you about has even come to my mind. Um, This past semester at school was a pretty rough one for me. Um, And kind of for a while I felt God tugging at my heart trying to speak to me, but my whole life I've not really been good at listening. Um, So I've always struggled with um, really wanting the open communication with God that I really needed. Um, So finally I I was sitting at Wesley one night, which is the church foundation that I go to at school. Um, Every Wednesday night we have a service, and I was sitting in the service, and at the very end I was finally ready to say, okay, I'm ready to hear what you have to say. Um, That week following, there were a few strange, I'll call them incidences, but we have um, a God that's purposeful. He's very intentional. So while I say incidences, they were incidences for me, but they were intentional on God's part. Um, For about four or five days, I got pounded after saying that I was ready for God to talk to me and I was not one who ever thought you know oh you know God's just God talks to people all the time he you know he comes down and speaks to people but um God really does actually have a way of speaking to you if you're willing to listen to those around you um And after a couple days, I decided, okay, this is too much for me to handle. I have to write all of this down. I'm a writer, as some people know. And so I I kept a journal of everything, and I titled it Discerning God's Will. So the first thing that happened to me after that um, night at Wesley was I had a dream, um, which is very normal for me, um, but in the dream, I had someone come to me that I, I don't know who they were. And normally they say, if you can't see their face, then you really don't know who that person is. You've never met them. But I did not know who this person was. And the first thing they said to me was, do not be afraid. Um, throughout that whole dream, um, 1 Peter 5, verse 10 um, kept coming up. So the next morning I decided, you know what, I'm just going to look this verse up because it sounds really familiar, and um, it definitely was. Um, It's a verse that says, throw all your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. That was my verse that I held on to throughout nursing school because it's not easy. I decided to open my Bible the next day after talking to a couple other friends and just trying to see what what God would have to say to me just through the scripture. And the first thing that I opened my Bible to, just opening it up, was um, Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. And for those of you who don't know, that's talking about the salt and the light of the earth that we should be. Um, so I didn't really take heed in, you know, the first thing that I opened to, but, um, I kind of started flipping around, but it just kept tugging at me to go on to that verse that I had first opened to. So I read that passage again, just like I have many times before. 
After reading Matthew, I decided to get my journal out that I keep when I come to church or Wesley and write down notes about sermons that I've heard so I can go back and meditate on some of them. Um, And in one specific Bible entry that I had was a group of verses, John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all your ways. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you about the direction you should go. I'll advise you and keep my eyes on you. And then Isaiah 30, 21, if you stray to the right or to the left, you will hear a word that comes from behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. Isaiah 48, 11, I am the Lord your God who teaches you for your own good, who leads you in the way that you should go. And then finally, James 1, 22 through 25, which talks about us needing to be doers of the word and that those of us who do the word will be blessed in whatever they do. So with all of those being from the same journal entry, I was like, okay, God's, God's definitely trying to talk to me here and I need to figure out what he's trying to say. Um, and then I came across um, a journal entry where um, a verse from Isaiah in chapter 6 says, Whom shall I send, and who will go for me? So at that point, I started realizing, all right, this is definitely, definitely something to pay attention to. And yet another entry, um, our own John, um, talked about, if I'd been there before, I'd probably know what to do, wouldn't you? And at this point, I was so confused, and I didn't know what to do, but it was okay, because when I saw that, I haven't been here before. I don't know what God's saying to me, and I need to figure this out. And um, and another thing that John said, he said, the Christian with depth is one who has failed, but learned to live with it. So, that was my rough point in nursing school. Um, After reading all of this, I was very overwhelmed by what God had to say. Um, I decided to seek counsel from a woman um, that's kind of been a mom to me through the Wesley Foundation, and we call her Green. Her name's Melissa Gilmore. And um, she was like, Danny, I think you know what you need to do. I think you know what he's saying. You just don't want to... You don't want to listen. You don't want to go. Um, so then a, a couple of weeks later, well, a couple of days later, um, we went to the Wesley Foundation again for our Wednesday night service. And um, the guy, it was for our, um, our Christmas service. And the guy referenced nursing school with the Christmas story. And that is not something I've ever c- connected whatsoever Um, but then he also said, any time in the Bible when an angel of the Lord appears to man, the first thing he always says is, do not be afraid. That was the first thing that got me to pay attention, was that dream with an angel telling me, do not be afraid. So... Finally, that night, after I left Wesley, I went with some friends to get ice cream, and after everything was done, I was pulling up at my apartment, and a guy from K-Love came on, and um, he was talking about Isaiah chapter 43. But before he started reading chapter 43, the first thing he said was, do not be afraid. So, um, I've always wrestled with feeling called into ministry. Um, Never thought I would be good enough or eloquent enough, uh, much less brave enough um, to stand in front of people and talk. Um, So um, with all that being said, um, I do feel called into ministry and this church has made that possible. Over Christmas break, I talked to John about 
everything that was going on. And um, he pretty much told me, you know, he, you know what's going on. You don't really have any questions. You're just needing to be affirmed. And um, that was true. So if you fast forward to Lent, um, we had the Lenten luncheons, and a guy named Bruce Case came and spoke. And I'm not sure what the conversation was that took place, but John told Bruce about me. Um, so fast forward uh, a couple more days, and John emails me and says, you know, you're going to get a call from someone named Bruce. I don't know who Bruce is. I don't know where he's from or what's going on, but he's going to talk to you about a job. And I was like, cool beans. <laughs> I could use that right now. Um, and so now I'm thrilled to be able to say I've officially accepted a position at Parkway Hills United Methodist for this summer as the youth intern. Bruce has given me complete creative control. Um, I've planned out 12 weeks worth of youth ministry um, activities, um, including going to Juneau, Alaska again. Um, but just seven days before that, without any warning, I got a call from a lady named Jill Buckley. And if anybody has heard anything about the Yellow Church that's right over here off Wood Street, I worked with them three years ago. And, um, I'll be the director of their summer camp this summer as well. Without applying for either of these jobs, God provided opportunities when I was willing to follow. So, with all that being said, I just want to thank this church for the love, support, thoughts, and prayers. God is definitely good. We will now have the call to worship.
please stand as we read the opening sentences. Letting go is sometimes a way of holding on. Letting the bad stuff go and taking the good stuff on pleases the Spirit of God and blesses those we care for and love. Please share the prayer. Please remain standing as we sing both verses of hymn number 389, Freely, Freely. Thank you so much. Remain standing and turn to 883 if you'd like to share with us an affirmation. This is one we've come to love, 883. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. And it is certainly true that God is with us, and it is certainly true that we are not alone. And Danny, I just want to tell you, you are eloquent, kid, and has a, a word of God for us, and that is good. And we are very excited about our feeling led into um, areas of Christian service. Uh, that's something to be very proud about. Um, I bring you greetings from France. Viva la France, they said. But they also said, uh, Viva la USA. And uh, it's interesting because you go to a country where you've told people might be cold or even rude, and you find people unusually warm and extremely helpful. And one little lady actually said, after we had just left, Omaha Beach, we thank you for having come. So that is no small thing at all. 
So it allows each and all of us together to be able to say and to be able to sing. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity will one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christian by our love, by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by promise not to bore you with too much travel log, but to give you one little incident. We ate at a Jewish delicatessen, and people love to eat outside. And uh, after we had eaten, we cleaned the table and put everything in the tray and brought it back into the young man behind the counter with his yarmulke on and all. And in France, right now, Jews have some fear because of the recent bombings. And the young man looks at Anthony and says, that's never happened before. <laughs> See, they have one attitude about who we are, and then you go as a different representative, and it makes a difference. It really does. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for a world out there, some of which we've never seen or known about. And thank you very much for that world inside each one of us, a world where we need to take off some things, take out some stuff. In a world where we need to sort of put on, get going in another way and another direction. Thank you very much for amazing grace, for the kind of grace that embraces so much, for the kind of grace that says there are none of us beyond the sphere of God's love and concern and call, and that each one of us have opportunity to come to the place where in letting go of that which is dark, we take hold of that which is light. And in that light, find joy and peace and reason for living like perhaps we had never dreamed before. Forgive us of our sins. Help us when we fall flat on our face in terms of the relationship between ideal and actual faith. And help us when we get up to realize that the only way we can go when we're down is up. Hear us then as your people together. We pray the prayer that your dear son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Please stand as we sing all verses of hymn number 395, Take Time to Be Holy.
please remain standing as we share Psalm 23, verses 1 through 6, found on hymnal page 754. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures. Leads me beside still waters, restores my life. Leads me in right paths for the sake of the Lord's name. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely the goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord as long as I live. Take a little time to be holy and pass the peace amongst yourselves. It's good to see you. It's good to be seen. Um, thanks, Danny. Um, all you, all, all us folks that kind of get stuck in the rut, and we think our faith just stays the same just because we keep doing the same things. It's really not how it works. I think we all need to be in a place like Danny, where we're not afraid and we're willing to to say to God, "Okay, whatever you want from me." Wherever you want me to go, I'm willing to do it. So thanks for your testimony, and we'll, uh, we'll continue to pray for you because being a paid Christian ain't fun sometimes. <laughs> Nothing against you guys. <laughs> if you will, look on the inside cover of our bulletin this morning. A few announcements that we have. Again, we're, we're, we're always glad to have you with us here at Wells. Glad to have Anthony and Keith back in one piece. Uh, if you're on the Council on Ministries, we have a meeting today immediately following the service downstairs. We are not eating. We're going to try to get that started and get, get everything done as fast as we can so that you can go on and do your deal about eating wherever you want to eat. Speaking of eating, if you're really interested in eating something good, next week our youth are having a plate lunch special, and it's uh, pork pulled pork and all the fixings that go with that. There'll be barbecue sauce if you want to put barbecue sauce on your pork. Otherwise, you can eat it plain, just like most Jewish people do. Um, <laughs> anyway, I don't know what that was about, but there's a... Uh, Ashley will be marrying Jared. Yes, she went to Jared. I love saying that. <laughs> I just love that. 
She went to Jared, and they're getting married on May the 28th in the Red Stick. But before they go down there, there's a group of folks here putting together a bridal shower for her. And it'll be on May the 1st. And do we have a time yet on that? So it's not just a chick thing? Not just a chick thing and okay. not at all. Now, what fun would that be? Well, I didn't know. If, can you have a mixed shower? Is that legal? Yes. Yes. You can shower yes. Is that like mixed bathing? Actually, you bathe the wrong It is not a bridal shower. It is a wedding shower. Oh. Okay. Well, I, I stand and I'm corrected. Wells will celebrate its 90th birthday. If you'd like to be a part of that, please call the church office or fill out a pew card. Uh, send it to admin at wellschurch.org, and we'll get you up to date when the next meeting is going to be. Altar flowers today are by Karen Pruitt in celebration of the birthday of her mother, Eleanor, which is April the 15th. Uh, gospel and show music is next month. Our choir is bodaciously getting ready to do some wonderful music for us during the month of May. So look forward to that. And if you're not in the choir and you've always wanted to do some show tunes, this is the time to come do some show tunes. Right, James? Yeah, all you. All right. Um, and Wednesday activities, if you miss Wednesday, you're missing a, a good treat. In the month of May, we're going to move to something a little different to try. Uh, choir will start at 515 instead of eating at 515, and then everybody will eat together at 630. We're going to try that for a month and see how that works. Just about eating together and fellowshipping together a little bit more instead of two separate groups. And then finally, uh, if you'd like to serve as a lay minister, you don't have to be called into full-time Christian service in order to share that testimony. But we know God is doing something in you and through you each day, and it'd be a great time to hear about that. Are there other announcements that you have? Can you go? Yes, yes ma'am. Other announcements? Okay, prayer request? Yes. Okay. I got a text message from Bruce Reynolds um, and just requesting prayer for he and Trina, but also selfishly prayer for him. So as you pray for Trina, do remember Bruce as well. Yeah, Craig. Um, if you found out on Facebook the other day, Wendell, there we the remember here in March 18th, his fifth grade decision that was Foley. And also, my mother's having knee surgery on her right knee finally Thursday. Okay. Yeah, Carol. Yes, ma'am. Well, the last several weeks I've been riding the big train back and forth to work. So I'm praying to get a car. So please pay for me sometime this summer. Okay. You got it. Yeah. yeah. Lorraine? Okay. Yeah, I'll be well about my, my immune stuff. Yeah, Keith begins his uh, immunotherapy, uh, chemotherapy treatments tomorrow. So remember him.
and she'll leave him on Sunday. <laughs> okay. Yeah, David. Okay. And I saw a hand. Yeah, Jean. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say, one of my very good friends started to chat today. He had a birth like a child. Don't be afraid. He had his son at Okay. All right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the worship that we've been able to be a part of to this point in the service for the words of love that have been spoken, for the heartfelt requests that have been made, and for those requests that remain silent but yet still bubble up within us. Lord, have mercy. Hear our prayer. Amen. 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 Birthdays, anniversaries. Yes, ma'am. My sweet little baby boy, Joshua, will be 23 next Saturday. All right. All right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. One of my best friends from high school is Jeff. Okay. Yes. Okay. Others? Yes. Yeah. Dr. Jones. I feel like an evangelist. Yes, in the back, I see your hand. Okay, Bryant, thanks. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Wow. Congratulations. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I did, you, you're blending in with the pew, man. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Cool. We'll sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. God bless you and keep you. Happy birthday to you. If our ushers would come forward, please. Let's pray together. God, all that we have, we've been privileged to receive from you. You ask for a portion in return, and you ask for it to be given cheerfully. So I pray that we do give, and that we get out, give out of love, and of grace, and of goodness. Amen.
beyond my wants, beyond my fears, we have a shepherd. A shepherd that calls us from unsafe places to safe ones. A shepherd that calls us to the kind of care, uh, the kind of nourishment that we need, the kind of environment that keeps us safe. It's good that we have a shepherd. And yet, this is a shepherd that does not impose himself, rather one that invites us into a fellowship with him. It's real good to be back with you. I wrote the little God stuff on a small, small desk in a small stateroom on a small ship in France this last week and thought about how attached we are even when we're 4,000 miles apart and how what we have begun is a thing that continues and how love is always expressed in care for the person in care for each person, not all, not some, all. And it's good to be able to be away and be able to be back. You all know that this particular disease is continuous and it's chronic and I'll be dealing with it for a while. And I said to the board that I really want to be off, I'll preach in a minute, but I really want to be off for a while to be able to travel and to do a few things like that. Not so much for recreation as um, just sort of be able to see what we can mean to where we go. You know, what being Christ here means being Christ there. And so we might be able to do that again. We'll just have to see all the, how all the treatments and stuff go. The one promise I want to make to you is I'm not going to stay here when it's negative and uh, not positive to you in some way. Um, want us to stay fresh together. I want to say also that uh, it's interesting because uh, our young, uh, eloquent woman this morning earlier said, about Schrader, and she's going to be here next Sunday, and we're going to give her half of each of our sermons. John is just finding out this right now, and uh, <laughs> since we both, both get about seven minutes to preach, <laughs> now we'll give her about 10 minutes at each service, so she, she's coming from South Africa uh, to be with us, and so that's very special. Some of you I know are real well and doing great, and some of you are real needy and need a little help. You know who that is? Us. It's the way it is. It's the world. Let's pray. And now, dear Father, we're about to read a little scripture. And the old preacher will try to offer a word or two. We just pray with all of our hearts that it might be a word alive that brings life and maybe even change when necessary. Not to those to whom we preach but to each one of us, the preacher and the preached. That prayer in Christ we pray, amen. amen. Please look with me at the back of the bulletin at the passage from Ephesians. <clears throat> if you don't mind, let's share every other paragraph. I'll begin one, and if you feel like it, join us on the in-between paragraphs. And if you don't feel like it, just read along as we do it. Since you've heard about Jesus, and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on the new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Stop telling lies. Let us tell neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. And if you're a thief, then quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. And don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those that hear them. And do not bring sorrow to the God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, 
just as God through Christ has forgiven you. The word of God for the people of God. And anytime you find somebody that says the scriptures are not too <coughs> practical or too relevant, uh, you might want to suggest that they take a look at that one and see if it doesn't relate to everyday life. There are rectangular tables and round tables on a ship. This ship carries 22 people. And the name of it is the River Ventura. And one day we sat at a round table with Ray and his wife Alma with John and with Sue, and Anthony and I, six at the table. One of the guys at the table, Ray, found out from the beginning that I was a preacher type. This often changes people's ways of relating. <laughs> he decided that he needed to let us know, and so he did. He said, I am a Buddhist, mostly, turned off to religion, generally, and turned off to Christianity, specifically, and especially. I said, hey, Ray, my name's Keith. <laughs> we sat at the table with them several times. And if you would ask Ray what the problem was, he would tell you. And the problem was one that you've heard before. And it's one that relates to us. Why is it that they act one way in church and another way outside of church? It's the biggie. It's the one we all deal with all the time. Because we're not here to play religious games or to have a sweet little moment. We're here to be transformed, to be changed, to be caught up in the presence and power and work of the living God. And what that means, and these will be a very, this will be a very simple servant. And just a couple of things. It means taking off. Some stuff needs to be taken off and out of our lives. It's very specific bitterness and wrath and rage and hanging on to something. You realize that sometimes people have broken relations and folks don't even know what or why because nobody ever cared enough to try to see if there wasn't something that could be done to fix it. Sometimes we need to take off, take off that whole sense of bitterness that's been consuming us for the longest time. Something happened a long time ago. You've had to put up with me for so long that you hear stuff again. But every time I talk about, talk about holding on to something for a long time, I remember the lady who said her husband cheated on her 38 years ago. And she's been angry with him ever since. And I said, are you still together? She said, of course. But I'm still bitter. I'm still anger. angry. You know, you know what the scripture is saying? You're not going to change his behavior. He's still controlling yours. His shortcoming, you know. We need to take off that kind of stuff. I remember when I was out in the front of Bay High School at Bay St. Louis playing touch football. Uh, one of the wonderful things that day was I actually caught the ball when it was thrown to me. That was rare. <laughs> and uh, then one of the guys I had thrown him, he was in a beautiful place uh, for us to make a touchdown. I'd thrown the ball to him and uh, he missed the ball. And so I said, excuse me, young people, well, damn. And we went on playing game. And after the game was over, a little 11-year-old boy came up to me and said, Keith. I said, yeah, 11 years old. Yes, sir. He said, did you say a bad word? I said, yeah, he said, well, shame on you. You know, you think people aren't watching? You think people aren't listening? I'm not saying that you have to go around on tippy-toe trying to be uh, purer than everybody else. I mean, that turns people off, and it's not even God's way. But I am saying we ought to pay attention. We ought to pay attention to the way we behave. We ought to pay attention to the way we do. We really ought to. That's necessary because God's not far away. And because your witness is right there, right then. I was sharing this with my Sunday school. We had breakfast at a little Jewish restaurant in Paris. Uh, they have suffered in their economy since the bombing because the bombers are looking for Jews and others. Sad world. And so we did what we often do. We cleaned up our little table, and Anthony put everything on the tray and took it inside, and the guy uh, looked at us like, I've never seen that happen before from an American. Don't you see, 
It's not the big theological discussion. It's a simple act of cleaning the table and putting something on a tray to take it to help somebody that needs maybe a little new vision of what we're like as Americans. We found people there loving, warm, and kind. People told us it wouldn't be that way. And you know what somebody on the ship said? That's because you went there being warm and loving and kind. And talking about taking off, it means sometimes giving something that's important of yourself to someone else. We stood at Omaha Beach. Bruce sent a text and said to Anthony, please bring me just a scoop of sand from Omaha Beach. Little man on our ship's named Bud. Bud Coons, his wife's name's Beth. Bud Coons was the only veteran that had been there that day. When we got on the bus and put our little communicators on, stick it over your ear, turn it on, the guide said, now turn to 707. Granddaddy Earl's favorite song from our hymnal. You can look at it if you don't know about it. Because he'd been there too. He'd been there. And then Bud, after Anthony and I get through adjusting to this, takes the little wreath. Here's the scene. There is an amphitheater uh, in a semicircle. And in the middle of it is a youth, um, a magnificent statue of a naked youth uh, with the waves around his feet. And they said it's the symbol of coming out of disaster and still being resilient, still being strong. And Mr. Coons walks up the steps and gently puts the wreath at the foot of the little statue. And then all of a sudden, the chimes begin to play the Star Spangled Banner. And the place is filled with folks. And one voice here and then another there. And then all of us singing the Star Spangled Banner. 4,000 miles away, looking out over the graves of 10,000 22-year-old or younger American men and women. Two women. The stats change. Some say 20, uh, 91 Jews. Some stats say 147. But there are crosses of marble and marble are stars of David. And as we were walking out, I saw something that helped me. War is a tough one for me. It said, it was a marble thing, it said, it was a letter from one of the soldiers. We did not come here to conquer. We came here for a cause. And the cause for which we came was the cause of freedom. And not even for people that we knew, but for people who needed us to come. And I thought to myself, wow. To represent a cause that is virtuous, that's a good thing. So here's the first part. Take it off, throw it away, whatever it is that's hampering, that's keeping you held back, held down, that doesn't allow you to grow and progress the way you want to. And then put on the good stuff. Tenderheartedness, forgiving one another as Christ forgave us. You know, sometimes we want to forgive those. We've talked about it. Let me tell you who we want to forgive. The people who didn't hurt us much. <laughs> or the people who didn't hurt us at all. But sometimes we don't want to forgive the people that we know hurt us. And we assume at least it was woeful. Maybe it was and maybe it wasn't. But that there is a need for forgiveness. But you know what? You and I are only going to be as healthy and as strong as we are able to receive forgiveness all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That includes me and maybe you. And then give away what you've received and sort of practice that. But in a, in a sense of tender heartedness, <clears throat> kindness with one another, um, preferring one another in love. We do stupid stuff. I'm sure you do simple stuff like putting money on the pillars of the room of the ship or the hotel. Why? Because the little people that work on board those things don't make much. And we don't know. And at the end of it, um, at the trip I wrote, I, I put some bucks on there and, uh, well, some euros, and wrote on there, um, have a good life. 
I'll never see that person again. That person will never see me again. Probably. But what you could do is say, I want to do a little something nice. I want to do a little something tender. And each one of us can find a way to do that. Think of a way to do that. Try to reach out. Try to reach to some of those people that maybe you've harmed or you're injured. And you can't fix it, but you can keep on trying. That makes you the stronger on the, in spirit and in truth. And it's so very, very significant. So tenderness, that doesn't mean weakness at all. Tenderness is the greatest strength in the world. When you have an evil, ugly world that wants to do you harm and you respond with tenderness. One of the guys that we were with had somebody just walk up to him on the street. And, uh, well, it was Ray. And wanted to fight with him. Didn't know if he was an American or a Frenchman or whomever. And uh, Ray said he was just the kind of person that lives for conflict. And I'm the kind of person that lives for peace. And I thought to myself, hey, Keith, what kind of person are you? You walking around living uh, for a fight? And I want to tell you, no, that's not me. I don't like to run away from it, but I'm not looking for that. I want to look for peace. But it's not peace without purpose, and it's not peace without some kind of philosophy. Our legislature is passing some laws. God help us. Are we trying to deal with stuff that's for the common and general good? Or are we trying to extend prejudice and the way we used to be and the way we used to think? What are we really about as a people, you know, as leaders and all? We've got a lot to do. I'm done except for this. You can sort of take it and run with it however it goes. There was a guy that we noted from the beginning that was overweight. He was very overweight. And uh, this is not to make judgment at all. It's just that it hampered his movement. And we were kind of worried about him because cobblestone streets all over the place. In the hotel we stayed in the last day, it had a vicious bathtub. <laughs> You know what a vicious bathtub is? A bathtub that's about this tall, right from here to the floor. See that? It's about, what would you say, son? Four feet? Four feet. Can't get in the darn thing. Can't get out of it once you're in, you know? <laughs> and we were both saying, we were saying, we were thinking about this guy. How's he going to, how's he going to bathe? You know, I know that's dumb, but we were. Well, but we didn't know him. We just saw him. He was at the other table and all. And so now we're going to go up on the choo-choo. That's what they call it. It's a little tourist train. With you all have probably seen those things. Three trains, you know, three cars, and a little engine, and pulls you up. And we get to the top of this mountain. What's the name of it? You remember it? Momor. Mount Momor. And there's a magnificent church back there that was built a long time ago to remember the revolution, the French Revolution, uh, where they sent people to help us become America. Huh? Anyway, uh, and then on the other side of it is Paris. Unbelievable. I swear, I never saw anything like it. I couldn't believe it. You stand there, and as far as you can see, city, 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 everywhere, tall, short, long. Um, you just almost have to say, wow. You know, that kind of stuff. Anyway, we're on our way up there, and we're about to get on the train. And here comes our friend, Russell, the heavy guy. And he's going to sit with us. And uh, so we got, we're on the front pew and uh, a little red thing with a little red uh, vinyl pad with three places to sit, Anthony and me. And Russell tries to get up and can't get up. And we don't want to embarrass him. What do we do? And he's grunting and he's moaning. He keeps on trying to get up. So we say, can we help you? No, I'll get it. So he tries it, doesn't get it. So I said, well, there's a little step down there. I said, I think you can pull it out. So he pulled it out, moan, groan, couldn't get it. So Anthony gave him an arm, tried, didn't get it. And then we both gave him an arm and finally he came up. And he sat down, and he said, man, didn't think I was going to get up at all. Then he said, heard you were from Mississippi. I said, sir, heard you were from Mississippi. I said, yeah. He said, me too. He said, I'm from Ocean Springs. I said, well, good. I said, we, my mom and dad had a house down at Gulfport, and we still go down there from time to time. It's kind of now our family home. Well, that's good. He said, where do you go to school? 
I said, which school? He said, college. I said, Millsaps? He said, Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi? I said, yep. He said, when? I said, 1954, 1958, why? He said, because that's when I went to Millsaps College. <laughs> I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, what's your name? I said, you already know. <laughs> and he said, no, no. He said, I just know you from Jackson, and I just wanted. I said, well, my name's Keith Tonkel. And he said, Keith Tonkel. He said, really? I said, well, as far as I know. <laughs> And he said, Keith, put his hand on me. I'm Russell Thompson. I was in your dormitory at Millsaps. And one of the guys that you, wrote, that you wrote about in your first book, he said, just check me out by reading your own book. And then he said, small world, isn't it? Mount Momar in Paris. And a world united because we have the opportunity to take off the bad stuff and put on the good stuff and keep on working the good stuff until good finally reigns over evil. Oh, God, make it so. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father, what a lovely time together we have. How beautiful to be able to worship. How lovely to know that the intent of true worship is not to make any of us feel guilty or ashamed, but to make us feel free and redeemed and ready for something else. Ready for something renewing and refreshing and better than before. Thank you for the chance to experience just that. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. You know what the, invita what the communion is, the invitation? The communion is, you're answering the invitation to come unto me. And so Danny is going to be offering the communion at the little communion station on the way out. If any of y'all would like to stop by just on the way out and take into yourself something of the purpose of Christ. What is the song? 396. 396. Please stand as we sing verse 1 of 396. Bless you. The Lord keep you. Um, take hands and let's sing our way out of here.